Hello class, and welcome to Biology 151, or more commonly known as the Biology of Pokemon. Yes, today we are having a science lesson, specifically biology in Pokemon. Just because there are lizards that shoot fire out of their mouths doesn't mean all Pokemon is science fiction. In reality, there are a few biological concepts that are present in the games that are scientifically sound. Today, I'm going to be discussing one of those concepts and its accuracy. I'm actually putting my biology degree to work. So class, let's begin. If you crave that mineral that is a shiny Pokemon, like me, you know the same old song and dance. You see an outbreak on the map and think, hey, this is an easier way to get shinies. Let's head over and see what happens. So that's what we do. We start going after the Pokemon, taking them down one by one until we get that message telling us that there isn't much left of the original outbreak. This means our chances of finding a shiny are even higher. Hi, I'm Professor Natural 20 and if you are constantly questioning life like I am, you may be wondering some things. Queries like, how do these outbreaks occur? And why do we get an increased chance of getting shiny Pokemon from them? Well, thanks to science, we should be able to give potential explanations that could answer these questions. That brings us to today's lesson, population dynamics specifically of Pokemon's mass outbreak events. To begin, let's go over what I mean by the concept of population dynamics. Population dynamics is the study of how and why organisms in a population change over time. Studying population dynamics investigates multiple factors, such as birth rates, death rates, disease, food stability, predation, and competition, just to name a few. So basically, look at a group of organisms in a habitat and watch everything that causes an increase and decrease in numbers. The population in question today are the Pokemon present in mass outbreak events. So far, we have been provided three series titles where these outbreak phenomena occur. Legends Arceus, Scarlet, and Violet. If we want to be technical about things, I guess that Pokemon Go would also be considered to have these events if you take into account community days and spotlight hours. Why do these outbreaks even occur? Next, we'll delve into potential explanations behind that and some real-world examples. So, let's say you have a population of rabbits in a prairie. One year, there is a surplus of greenery, aka food for the bunnies, and all the foxes were only feeling like eating chickens this year. With the abundance of sustenance and lack of predation, the rabbits reproduce without worry. And if you know anything about rabbits, they reproduce rapidly. If you don't know anything about rabbits, the average gestation period, also known as the length of the pregnancy, of an eastern cottontail is 27 days. After those 27 days, the rabbit gives birth to anywhere between one and nine young. They do this about two to four times a year. Please bear with me, we are about to do some math. Here is one of the many different formulas that can be used to calculate population increase where PN equals the new population size, P equals the current population, B equals the birth rate of the rabbits, and T equals time. In this example, to start, we're only going to be looking at the female rabbit population. Let's start small. Say you have two mother rabbits, and they give birth to two females each over the course of a year, represented by 12 months, aka a gestation period every three months. So, plugging that into the formula, we get PN equals 2 plus 2 times 2 times 12, which equals 50 female rabbits. So then, the next year, we have the same birth rate of 2 females, and we get PN equals 50 plus 50 times 2 times 12, which is 1,250, and so on and so on, let's say, for 8 years? <laughs> After eight years, we have a total of about 300 billion females, just from the starting two mother rabbits. Now, don't forget the males, because it takes two to get freaky deaky. So if we're also getting equal amounts of males in this population, you gotta basically double this number. That's a lot of rabbits after eight years. Don't worry, you're not gonna be seeing 600 billion or so rabbits running around on the regular. There are factors present reducing this number, like lifespan, predation, disease, food supply, etc, etc. So, after I've broken your brains with math, let's discuss how it relates to the outbreaks. Having hatched my fair share of eggs in Scarlet and Violet, 2000 and counting, still no shiny Eevee, 
I've seen firsthand how quickly a population size of Pokemon can grow, so honestly it's no surprise that these outbreaks are present in the game. If I can hatch 50 Eevee in 30 minutes, imagine what a population out in the wild can do. That's why we're able to find outbreaks of most Pokemon, including super rare ones like Authentic Form Sinistee. Some ecological factor allowed the population to boom and we're able to benefit from it by getting access to them. With increased shiny odds. So now it's time to talk about what sparked the inspiration for today's video. Why do we have increased shiny odds in outbreaks? So the other day I was hunting some Flittle in an outbreak and a thought dawned on me. Are the shiny Pokemon in outbreaks the result of inbreeding? Before we go all making jokes about Sweet Home Alabama cousins and whatnot, let me remind you about our rabbits from earlier. Remember, we started with only two females and then the population exponentially boomed. As such, you do find that sometimes related individuals reproduce together, especially in smaller population sizes. This is where something called the coefficient of inbreeding comes into play. The coefficient of inbreeding is a number that quantifies the probability of an individual having identical genes by descent from a common ancestor of the individual's parents. It will make sense. That was a lot. A gene consists of two primary components received from the DNA of each parent. These are called alleles. What alleles you have determine how a trait is presented. When I say traits, I'm talking things like hair color, eye color, dimples, etc. One thing that is helpful in figuring out the coefficient of inbreeding is a pedigree, or family tree if you will. Here we have a pedigree with three generations of Pikachu. As you can see at the latest generation, there is a loop that forms with the last offspring. So now, we get to do more math. The inbreeding coefficient can be calculated with the following formula. Here, fx equals the inbreeding coefficient of the individual x, L equals the number of loops present in the pedigree without passing the same individual twice, N equals the number of individuals in a given loop. We use 0.5 here because parents pass down 50% of their alleles to the next generation, and FA equals the coefficient of inbreeding of the common ancestors of X's parents. What do I mean by loop? Well, let me draw that out for you. As you can see, we have two loops. And in each loop, we have five members. Also, the common ancestors, the two at the very top here, are not inbred. So, their COI is zero. So let's plug in these numbers. This gives us a COI of 12.5%, which again, is the chance of the alleles being identical. If they continue to grow their lineage and keep creating loops, the COI will get bigger and bigger. The bigger the COI, the easier it is to predict what traits will be passed down to the offspring. Let's look at some Punnett squares. These are a handy dandy tool to predict the outcome of an offspring based on the alleles of the parent. Presented here is one of the first Punnett square examples I was ever shown in my educational journey. Here, we're having capital W be the dominant allele, meaning it expresses itself over the lowercase w, aka the recessive allele. In this situation, if you have a genotype of two capital W's, the P will be round, and any offspring that this individual has will also be round. And that's because if you have one capital W and one lowercase w, the P is a carrier, which means it's still going to be round, but it can pass down the allele for the wrinkled P. And if you have two lowercase w's, it's going to be a wrinkly p. Here are six possibilities of how alleles could work out with different genotype crossings. Each corner of the box represents a 25% chance of a certain allele combination. Dog breeds are a primary example of how inbreeding has been used to influence specific characteristics within a population. For example, Bulldogs have been bred to have flatter faces and wider, stouter bodies, and Sharpays have been bred for their wrinkly skin. It's not just dogs, though. A non-dog example is Holstein dairy cows, which have been bred together to increase milk production. So let's look at outbreaks now. Say being a shiny Pokemon is a recessive trait. A smaller population size increases the opportunity that these recessive traits have to arise in said population based on what we just went over. With outbreaks in Scarlet and Violet, I'd say there's about 80 Pokemon present at the beginning of the outbreak. 
If we consider outbreaks to be an isolated population, and every time that we run away and come back to respond the horde being a new generation, then of course we're going to see an increased likelihood of shiny Pokemon just by encountering the outbreak. And then you remove about 60 Pokemon to get that message that there isn't much left of the original outbreak. With only 20 Pokemon left in the population, the odds of more carriers of the recessive shiny gene being present increases. Also, the opposite could be true, and the dominant trait proliferates, and you get skunked, and you have to make a new sandwich. So they continue to breed indiscriminately with the reduced population, making genetic cross after cross, which goes on and on until that beautiful, beautiful shiny Pokemon appears. Wish this was actually how it worked in game, cause I'd probably have a shiny Eevee by now. So there you have it class, an overview of some population dynamics in Pokemon. Like I mentioned at the beginning of class, there are a lot of factors that can affect a population, and I think there's still a ton we can still cover in more videos. We haven't even gotten into ideas about predation and how everything truly is just a huge circle. However, that is a lecture for another time. I so enjoyed teaching you today, and I hope you learned something. If you like what you just watched, I'd really appreciate if you dropped me a like. If there's anything specific you want me to cover, let me know in the comments, and I'll do some research and see what I can do. And if you want to catch more lectures, go ahead and hit that subscribe button, because I've got plenty to continue nerding out about. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, and until next time, class dismissed.